Bonjour! Welcome to High Point! How are you guys doing today? I hope that you're having a really great day. We are on our way to a really new and exciting adventure, but... What? Oh no, I said bonjour! Uh, I mean, you all speak French, don't you? Oh, you don't? Well, bonjour is how you say hello in French. Well, would you like to try it? You can say it with me. It's very easy. Bon. Good job. Jour. Yeah, that part's a little bit harder. But you did a great job. Um, in fact, you did such a great job. Why don't we all take a second, turn to the person who's sitting next to us, or maybe standing next to us, and say, Bonjour. Wow, you guys did a great job. In fact, you're doing such a great job of doing the things that I tell you to do, why don't we play a game with that? Would you like to play a game today? All right, perfect. I'm excited to play a game too. So you guys have heard of the game um, Simon Says. Uh, for those of you that haven't heard it, it's the game where somebody is Simon and Simon has to tell you what to do. So they say, Simon Says, do jumping jacks or do um, a dance or something like that. And then you have to do it. But if they don't say Simon Says, then you don't have to do it. So our game's going to be a little bit like that today. But I'm going to be the person given the, the, the commands, and you guys are just going to do them. I don't have to say Simon Says. You guys are just going to do them. Can you follow me when I do these things? Okay, I'm going to tell you, and you go ahead and do them, okay? All right. Ready? Okay. Do jumping jacks. Good job, you guys. I saw you doing jumping jacks. Okay. All right, let's see what else. <clears throat> oh, I know, I know. I want you to yawn and stretch. Oh, good job, guys. Those are some pretty big stretches. Um, let's see, what's next? Oh, 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 I know. Scratch the top of your head. Just like this. Scratch the top of your head. It's probably a little bit easier for me because I don't have any hair. But good job scratching your heads. Um, I got a good one. How about we make faces? Okay, you got to do what I'm doing, okay? Ready? Make faces. The... You guys made some pretty good faces. Um, hmm. I know. Let's act like a chicken. Wow, you guys keep going, keep going, keep going. You guys keep acting like chickens. Oh, you oh, you guys are doing great job acting like chickens. Okay, now stop and go ahead and have a seat. I mean, our game, at least it was pretty fun for me to picture you guys all dancing around like chickens. That was just for fun. But the truth is, guys, in life, you have to remember, if you follow somebody else, they can make you look a whole lot sillier than you just look dancing like a chicken. If you follow what somebody else says, they can make you look kind of silly. And in fact, that's what our life verse for this unit is all about. Um, it comes from Proverbs, uh, chapter 13, verse 20, and it says, He who walks with the wise grows wise, and, but a companion of, those, of fools pardon me, suffers harm. So I mean, let's break that down a little bit because it's two different pieces. He who walks with the wise grow wise. If you spend time learning from people who are wise, talking with people who are wise, um, you're just spending time with them, you will grow wise also. But if you decide to be a companion or somebody who hangs around with fools, well, you're going to suffer harm. You know, you, you might be made fun of. You might get into trouble. It, it could be all sorts of harm. But if you make your time, you spend it hanging around with people who are, are foolish or do foolish things, it's going to eventually cause you harm. You know, today we're going to start this brand new um, unit, looking into peer pressure. Now, some of you may have heard of peer pressure before, and some of you may have not. <clears throat> Excuse me. Peer pressure is... Uh, here's the easiest way to explain to you. 
when I was a kid, um, if I if I wanted to do something that everybody else did, my my mom would say, "If everybody else jumped a bridge, jumped off a bridge, would you?" And the answer was probably yes. Um, I mean, sadly, if everybody else was jumping off a bridge. I wouldn't want to be the one that wasn't part of the cool crowd. Everybody else was doing it, so I'd, I'd want to do it too. So I would have gotten up on the bridge and jumped, and I probably would have gotten hurt. Or at the least, I would have gotten kind of, you know, wet from swimming. But, but the truth is that that statement, if everybody else was jumping off a bridge, would you, is really true because it explains peer pressure really well. Everybody else or you think everybody else is doing it, doing whatever it is. I mean, a lot of times in my case, it was, I want these certain pants, and I never got the kind of pants that everybody else had. Um, or it might be, you know, can I watch this movie? Everybody else is watching it, and I'm going to get be the only one not watching it. I'm going to get made fun of. But... It was me giving in to pressure was me giving into peer pressure or wanting to be able to give into peer pressure. Peer pressure is the idea that everybody else is doing something. Or maybe it's somebody telling you that. Hey, you got to use these swear words because everybody else uses them. And you then have to make a decision. Do I want to do what everybody else is doing, even though I know it's wrong? Or do I want to do the right thing and maybe have to be left alone? It's not really easy, and the fact is that peer pressure it, this is kind of a hard one to explain a little bit in case you hadn't understood it. Um, but it's letting other people pressure us to do something we know we shouldn't do. I think that sums it up really, really well, and it's really hard. It's really hard, especially when we don't want to be left out. Um, there's a phrase, uh, FOLO. I don't know if you've ever heard of FOLO, but it's fear of being left out. We don't like that idea. We don't like being able to, or not being able to be popular. We don't like not feeling like we're a part of the group. And so, guys, let me, uh, let me assure you that this isn't something that just kids struggle with. Adults do too. Adults do too. It doesn't go away just when you get older. Peer pressure is always there. And because it is always there, we really have to find ways and, and reasons to not give in to it when we know it's doing something that is absolutely wrong. Everybody has an opinion, guys, but really whose opinion should we care about? Yeah, we should, really, we should really only be concerned with God's opinion. We need to have people around us who want us to do the right thing. See, this is really, really difficult. Growing up, when I was a really young kid, I had some really great friends, and they helped me make really good choices. And when I became a teenager, um, I wasn't real popular, and so I started to hang out with a bunch of people that were not necessarily doing good things, and... I felt pressured to go along and do the not very good things. And it got me into a lot of trouble. If I'm just being really honest, it got me into a lot of trouble as, as a teenager. And it's really important that we have people around us, our friends, our, our family, our, our people that surround us and that, that are our people that want us to do the right things. Now, today we're going to talk about our Bible hero, Samson. Now, Maybe you've heard the story of Samson before. If you have, shh, don't say anything, because this is a really great story. But he, our Bible hero Samson had, uh, was really blessed to have two people who wanted him to make right choices. In fact, those two people actually made some really good decisions for him. That sounds strange. They made decisions for him. Hmm. Did you guys know that you have people in your life who make decisions for you? Yeah, you do. I'll give you some clues. Okay, so um, these people are usually, well, they are older than you. 
No. No, no, it's not me. I know I'm old, but it's not me. I don't make any decisions for you. I'll give you another hint. They love you. No. No, it's not Pastor Brad. He loves you very much, too. But, but, and yes, he's, he's even older than I am. But, he doesn't make decisions for you either. Let me give you another clue. These people usually share a house with you. Do you know who they are? Yeah, it's our moms, our dads, grandmas, grandpas, guardians, whoever it is that, that lives in the house with us and helps take care of us, guys. They're the ones who are there to help make good decisions for us. And we're really grateful for them. And you guys, I've got a story for you about how Samson's parents made some really good choices for him. Uh, now, <clears throat> as I start off this Bible story today, I want you guys to listen really carefully for whenever I say the, the words Nazarite vow, okay? I'll explain to you later on in the story what that means, but for now, whenever you hear me say Nazarite vow, I want you to put your hands on your heart and say, I promise. Okay? So let's practice it a few times. Are you ready? Nazarite vow. I promise. Okay, let's, let's do it one more time. I'll just put my hand on my heart to remind you, but I won't say it this time. Nazarite vow. Good job, guys. I think you're ready, okay? Now, our story is set in the land of Israel. The Israelites were God's people, if you remember, but they had disobeyed God. Um, to be honest, that's kind of a running theme. Uh, the Israelites were God's people, and then they disobeyed God. We can't say anything really bad about them, though, because we are also God's people, and... A lot of times we disobey him too. But this time, because they had disobeyed him, their enemies, the Philistines, had conquered them. They came in, they said, Ha ha! We're in charge now! You're going to listen to everything we say! They conquered them, and they took over. And the Israelites were really sad because of the Philistines. But Manoah and his wife were even more sad than the rest of the Israelites. See, they were sad because they didn't have any children. They wanted to have children, but they, they just couldn't have any. And one day, Manoah's wife, she's walking down the street doing her thing, and a stranger appears to her. All of a sudden, he just walks up and he says to her, check this out, okay, you know this because I'm going to tell you, the stranger was an angel. Manoah's wife, she didn't know that this stranger was an angel. He walks up and he says to her, hey, <clears throat> I know you don't have any kids, but... You're going to have a son. Do not drink any grape juice. Do not drink any wine. And do not drink any alcoholic drinks. Okay. Be careful whatever you eat. Follow all the food rules that God gave the Israelites. We'll get into those another time. But just know that there were some very special things um, that the Israelites had to, had to not eat. Um, they just they couldn't eat them at all. So he said, hey, follow all the food rules that God gave the Israelites. Then they told him... When your son is born, do not cut his hair. Man, I wish somebody would have said that to my parents. No, I'm just bald as bald. But they, the, the stranger, this angel, told her, do not cut your son's hair. And then he said, he, the angel said, he, referring to the son, will be special to God. A Nazarite from the time he is born. He will help rescue the Israelites from the Philistines. Now, <clears throat> do you remember what I just said? What special instructions did the angel give to Manoah's wife um, about her food and her drink? That's right. No grape juice. No wine, yes. Yeah, absolutely. No alcohol at all. Good, good. Uh, what about the food? Yes, she had to follow all of the food rules, the rules about eating that God had given to the Israelites. Good job listening, guys. What special instructions did the angel give her about her son's hair? That's right, she couldn't cut it. Perfect. And then the angel said her son, Samson, was to be a Nazarite from the time he was born. Now, a Nazarite was someone who made the Nazarite vow. 
Good job, guys. A vow is a promise. Now, the Nazarite vow, excellent, it was a special promise made to God. People who made that vow promised to give themselves to God for a special purpose. They were giving themselves completely and totally to God for a special purpose. Hmm. When people took the Nazarite vow, good, they couldn't eat or drink anything at all from a grapevine. So no grape juice, no wine, nothing, nothing. They, uh, they couldn't cut their hair, so they could never chop their hair off or be bald like me. Uh, let's see, what else? They couldn't touch anything that was dead. My mom would have loved that rule. You know, she didn't like me bringing in smushed toads and frogs and things, that the crushed turtle that I found on the road. You know that roadkill stuff? I would bring, when we lived in the country, I would bring that into the house all the time and she'd get really mad. So she would have loved that rule, but the Nazarites could not touch anything dead. If they did any of those things, then they would break their Nazarite vow. Excellent. Do you guys think we should keep promises? Yeah. Keeping our promise is really important because it shows that we can be trusted. If I promise you guys that I'm going to give you a million dollars, I better show up with a million dollars. I'm not promising you that. I, I, I do not have a million dollars. Sorry. Not going to that happen with that one. But if I made that promise, I better be able to be able to do it. We should keep our promises. And since the Nazarite vow, excellent, was a promise, do you think it was really important to keep that vow? You better believe that it was, absolutely. Now, if you make a promise to God, it's really important to keep that promise. If you say, God, I promise you that I will listen to you, you should listen. If you say, God, I promise to do whatever you ask me to do, we better be prepared to do whatever he asks us to do. And now, guys, kind of getting back to our story there, now that we know what a Nazarite vow, yes, is, we're going to get back to our story. Manoah's wife had seen the angel. I don't know about you, but how would you feel if someone you did not know happened to appear to you out of nowhere, told you all about the future, and gave you really specific, special instructions. Yeah, I might feel a little creeped out, too. Might feel a little bit like, what is going on here? Absolutely. Yeah, you might feel a little bit like, what is going on? Like, this must be really special. I mean, would you tell anybody? Yeah, me too. I would probably run home and tell my wife and I'd be, be like, whoa, you got to check this out. This is what just happened. Yeah, maybe, yes, maybe you run home. You tell your mom and dad or your brother and sister. Yeah, you just got to tell somebody. And that is exactly what Manoah's wife did. She ran to tell her husband what had happened. She told him about what the angel had said to her about the food and about what the baby would be and all of those things. And I don't know about you, but if somebody came running into my house and told me all this, I would probably be like, whoa, 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 back up a little, back up a little bit. What? I need more information. And that's exactly what Manoah did. Manoah said, I need more information. And so he prayed and he asked, he said, God, please let the stranger that you sent come to teach us how exactly to raise the boy who will be born. And guess what? Nah, yes, the man came back and appeared to Manoah's wife a second time. She's just walking down the street doing her thing. Woo, maybe she was bringing home something from the market and boom! This stranger appeared in front of her again. This time, however, Manoah said, wait, 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 Manoah's wife said, wait, 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 just wait right here. I gotta go get somebody. I'll be right back. And she ran off as fast as she could go. And she ran, and she got all the way home. She grabbed the Noah, and she pulled him out of the house by his cloak, and they ran back to this stranger. She said, here, there he is. Whew. They were probably a little bit tired. And Manoah asked, <laughs> after he caught his breath, when your promise of a son comes true, what rules should we follow as we raise him? 
The angel just repeated everything that he had said earlier to Manoah's wife. Uh, I know you guys already repeated them for me once, but let's see if you still remember. What was she not supposed to drink? Yes, anything from a grapevine. What was she supposed to eat? Yep, absolutely, only the foods that God said Israelites could eat. What vow was Samson supposed to take? That's right. What was he not supposed to cut? Yes, his beautiful, luscious locks. What was a Nazarite not supposed to touch? Yeah, yeah, nothing dead. Absolutely great. You guys did a fantastic job remembering what Samson's parents were supposed to do. So the angel told Manoah that he should do these things. And he said, do them because this is for the son that I know you're going to have. And Manoah was super excited and super thankful to hear from God. In fact, he was so excited that he said, hey, would, would you please... Would you please just wait a moment? Just stay here with us for a little bit. I'm going to go off and grab a young goat. I'm going to fix it so we can feast together. We can have something to eat together. Because I'm so happy to have heard from you. I'm going to go get it. I'll bring it back. I'll make it. We'll eat. It'll be delicious. And the angel said, nope. Hmm. The angel said, nope. He, what he said was, I won't eat your food. But, he said, you can offer it to God. So Manoah did run off. He had the angel wait there. He ran off with his wife. They got the goat. They, they got all the stuff ready. They prepared it as a sacrifice. And they put it on the altar to offer it. And as soon as Manoah lit the fire, poof! Suddenly that angel ascended into the flames. He went right up with the flames as they shot up. Now, a little bit interesting aside, this just so that you and I can understand, this is most likely um, was Jesus, the way that he appeared to people before he was born as a baby in Bethlehem. Uh, because we know that angels don't, they, they don't accept worship. We don't worship angels. We worship Jesus. And this angel of the Lord, as we call him, accepted this offering. So we know that it was Jesus because he can be worshipped. Anyway, neither here nor there. I just wanted to make sure I pointed out to you that we worship Jesus and, and God. Um, but as soon as this happened, I mean, you light the fire and woof, the flames kick up, you know, like a good bonfire. Woof, and then all of a sudden that, that angel is gone. He ascends right up with those flames. This is amazing. And all of a sudden... Remember I told you Manoah and his wife, they didn't know this was an angel? In that moment they realized this was an angel, and that was not a man. And Manoah, he, he fell down on his face. His wife, she fell down on their face, and Manoah cried out, We're going to die! We're going to die! We've seen God! We're going to die! And Manoah's wife, she's over there, and she elbows him in the ribs, and she says, No! No, we're not going to die! We're not going to die! If God had been to kill us, he wouldn't have accepted our burnt offering, would he? And Manoah said, you know how you are when you, you're kind of emotional. I mean, was she right though, guys? Absolutely she was right. She was absolutely right. When Samson was born after this event, his parents kept their promise perfectly to God. They made sure that Samson followed the rules of the Nazarite vow. They had a really big responsibility, guys. God wanted them to help Samson follow God. Did you know that God wants your moms, dads, grandparents, guardians, whoever it is that's, that's in charge of you, God wants them to help you follow God? Yeah, God wants the same thing for them. He wants them to help you, just like Samson's parents helped Samson follow God. He wants them to give you guys wise rules. He wants them to help you to follow 
those wise rules, and he wants all of that together to be able to point you in a direction to follow him. I mean, do you have to obey any of Samson's rules? How many of you can cut your hair? Okay, I'm glad most of you can cut your hair. How many of you can eat um, a pork chop or bacon? Yeah, see, the Israelites couldn't do that. That was one of the foods they couldn't eat. Uh, let's see, how many of you can go out like I didn't scoop up dead frogs and bring them into the house? Okay, maybe you can't get them into the house. My mom, she was really kind of always busy, and so I got them into the house. But we can go out and scoop them up. No, you're absolutely right, though. We do have the rule, no alcohol. Yep, that's a good rule. That is a good rule. We do have to follow that one, absolutely. But now that we've kind of gone through some of those rules for, for Samson, what are some rules you have in your house? You know, I think about what are some of the rules your parents give to you? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you guys a great example. At our house, we have a bedtime routine. And in the bedtime routine, they, everybody knows their rules. We go upstairs, we brush our teeth, well, we use flossers, then we brush our teeth, then we use mouthwash, then we wash our faces if it's not bath night, uh, we've got our pajamas on, we go in uh, and I read a story to my oldest son, Lincoln, and then we pray, and then I give him a kiss goodnight and tuck him in, and we go to bed. He knows those rules. He knows there are rules that we have in the house like we don't swear. He knows we have rules in our house that we don't lie. He knows, he knows that in our house there are certain TV shows and movies that we aren't going to watch. Harrison knows it too, but he's just a little young and doesn't always understand it. But we have rules, and our parents, your parents, me, we have rules for the exact same reason that God gave rules to Samson's parents. We want everything we do, and your parents want everything that they do, to help you to grow up and serve and honor God. I mean, truly, you probably are not going to take a Nazarite vow. Good job remembering, guys. And you might not ever rescue people from their enemies, though maybe you will. But you can absolutely, without any doubt, grow up to be a man or a woman who makes God really proud. And let's just be really truthful here. When we obey our parents, who are we really obeying? Yeah, God. And who should we always obey no matter what? That's right, God. Now, I realize here, and I'm just bummed out, um, I had a, an object lesson that I did not bring myself in for, but I'm going to explain it to you anyway because I think it's a really great lesson. So let's say you have a big cup. And you have an empty glove. Is that empty glove going to be able to pick up that cup? No. You, you can try the, the, the glove. Just you put the glove on there. It just falls off. Or maybe it just sits on the top. But it cannot pick up that cup. Now, in, if you take that same cup and that same glove, but you put your hand into that glove, you now can use that glove to pick up the cup and move it. That empty glove, guys, that's like us when we don't obey God. We're, we're empty. We don't have the strength to resist peer pressure. We don't have the strength to resist people telling us the things that we need to be doing. Smoking cigarettes or, or lying or stealing. We don't have the strength. We're like that empty glove. It just flops around. But when we allow God to live in our lives and the Holy Spirit to come into us and fill us like the hand fills up that glove, he gives us the power we need to resist peer pressure. He gives us the power to be able to say, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it. I know it's wrong. And I know it's going to cost me. People might make fun of me, but I'm not going to do it. God gives us that power. If we want to win in the fight against peer pressure, we have to absolutely have to obey God. 
Now maybe you're watching and you say, you know what, I, I don't really care about peer pressure. Um, I got, I got, I'm just gonna have a lot of friends and I don't care. That's okay. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not upset with you. I pray that nothing that you do will end up being bad because I love you guys and I don't ever want to see anything bad happen to you. But if you are watching and you say, you know what, I want, I want to win against peer pressure. I don't want to be pressured to do things that I know are wrong. Maybe you're saying, I want to obey God and I want to let him help me beat peer pressure. Then guys, you need to ask Jesus into your heart and your life. All of us make mistakes and do wrong things. And, and I'm going to just go off the, the script here just a little bit. I'm not a big fan of, of saying the word mistakes because mistakes mean that you didn't know. That, that what happened was an accident. There was no way to, to, um, to stop it. There was, you know, nobody was at fault. That's a mistake. What I prefer is to say that we all have made bad choices. Because guys, when we make a bad choice, and we admit that it was a bad choice, then we have to own that. It belongs to us. We admit we did it. And the truth is, Paul tells us in the Bible, we have all done that. Because the, another name for the bad choices and the wrong things that we've done is sin. Paul says that we have all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. Every single one of us. Yes, me. Yes, Pastor Brad. Yes, your mom. Yes, everybody in this entire world. We've all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. But God loves us, guys, so much. He sees us. He sees our value. He sees how much worth we have to him. And he loves us. But guys, let me tell you, he hates sin. It isn't, oh, I don't mind that you sinned a little bit. I still love you. He loves you. And at the same time, he hates that sin. That's a tough place, isn't it? I mean, God loves you so much but at the same time, he hates those bad things, those bad choices, the wrong things we've done. He hates them. And we've talked about in the past how that keeps us, those wrong things and those bad choices, they've kept us separated from God. God wasn't happy with that because remember, even though he hates the sin, he loves you more than you will ever know. And so he sent his only son to come and to die on the cross. So that you don't have to live with all of that sin in your heart. I got to backtrack a little bit here, guys. I know I said we have all sinned, and that is truth. But there is one person in the entirety of history from the beginning of the world until February 19th, 2021, there is one person and one person only who did not ever sin, and that is Jesus. Never once, not a white lie. He never took something that wasn't his own. He never did anything that was sinful. Ever. Ever. He lived a completely perfect and sinless life. And guys... Understand, he faced the exact same kind of peer pressure that we do. He faced the exact same kind of peer pressure. The idea that everybody else is doing it, so you better do it too, or otherwise you're going to be out. You won't be cool. He faced that same exact peer pressure. The pressure to fit in and be just like everybody else, even if what everybody else is doing is completely wrong and against God. He faced that same peer pressure. And he never caved in. He never sinned. He came, he lived perfect, sinless, and then he went to the cross. And guys, this is where I really want you to listen. Because remember I said we've all sinned? We have all made bad choices. We have all done wrong things. And we own them. They belong to us. 
And Paul tells us that the wages, what we get paid, because we're going to get paid for all those bad things we've done, and the payment we're going to get is death. And that means we're going to be forever separated from God. We'll never be able to be close to him for all of eternity. But Jesus came and he went to that cross and he said, Hey, Josh, you know all those sins, those bad things, those, those bad choices and, and terrible things you've done and said? Why don't you give them to me? I'll take them. He said, I'll take all of your bad things. I'll take all of the sins that you've ever done. Give them to me. And he took every single one of our sins all of the sin of the entire world, and he placed it upon his own shoulders. The man who had never sinned, God in human flesh who had never sinned, he took all of that on himself, and then he went and he died with all of that sin on top of him, separated from his father. But praise God. Sunday's coming, as they say. As we get closer, closer to Easter, you'll hear that more often. Sunday's coming. And on Sunday, he was raised from the dead. He defeated death. He defeated sin. And now he has a gift. All that sin of ours that he took on top of him, it's paid for. All that wages, the payment we were going to get, that death, yep, paid for. Instead of our sins, now he gives us a gift. And he says, take it. And when we open it, guys, it is salvation. We are saved from the penalty of our sins. We are saved from the penalty of our sins. And we can be with Jesus. And he can help us overcome all of those bad things. He paid for them, guys. And he's offering you that gift today. When God created you, he created you for a purpose. A purpose that nobody else but you can do. Just like Samson, remember we said the Nazarite vow made him be set apart. Uh, he gave himself to God to, for a very special purpose. That is exactly your life. God created you with a very special purpose, but sin got in the way. And now Jesus has taken it and paid for it. And he says, here, have my gift have your sins completely cleaned and forgiven. But you got to take the gift. You have to take the gift. Yes, he paid for our sins, but we keep them unless we ask him to forgive us. Yes, they're paid for. But if we don't take the gift, we own them our entire life and into all of eternity. God's plan for your life is beautiful and it's wonderful and it is a purpose and a plan that is only for you only you can do it but sin has gotten in the way do you want to accept his gift today do you want to open up that present and be able to say yes god forgive me of all of the terrible things i've done and said and then be made clean completely clean from them do you want to start living in that purpose, that wonderful, amazing purpose that God has for you? Do you want to do that today? If you do, I'm going to pray here in a second, and I'm going to give you some instructions. If you want to pray that prayer. If not, I just ask that you would go ahead and pray along with me, but... I want everybody to close their eyes. I want, I want everybody's eyes closed. I don't want you looking around. I don't want you to, to worry about what mom, dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, whoever's in the room with you, I don't want you to worry about what they're doing or what they might think. Because, guys, this decision is between you and God alone. I know I can't see you, so my eyes are going to stay open. And I know I can't see you to see if you, if you decided or not decided, but God does. That is all that matters. So with your eyes closed, and you would say, bowing your head, eyes are closed, and you would pray and say, you know what, I, I really want that free gift. I really want to be able to have all of those things that I have to own. I want them to be forgiven. I want Jesus to forgive me. 
Or you say, I really, really want to, to have and live in that purpose and that plan for my life. I want to start today. I just want you to shoot your hand up as fast as you can. Doesn't matter if nobody else in the room raises their hand. It doesn't matter if everybody else in the room raises their hand. Your eyes are closed and this is between you and God. If you want that gift of forgiveness and you want to live in that plan and that purpose that he has for you, I just want your hand to shoot up as fast as you can. I want you to just hold it there for a second. Recognizing that, that God is with you. He sees you, he acknowledges you, and he forgives you because you're asking him to. You can put your hands down, guys. I'm going to pray a prayer here. Um, I'm just going to ask you to, to repeat after me. Uh, if you raise your hand, that's fantastic, and I want you to really, really focus on this prayer. If you didn't raise your hand, or maybe you didn't need to raise your hand, I just ask that you would repeat it after me anyway because it's a fantastic prayer. Dear Jesus, I know that I have done wrong things and I need your forgiveness. I need you to take away my sins and forgive me. Now guys, with, with your eyes closed, just quietly, I want you to tell God whatever those things are that you need him to forgive you for. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose from the grave so my sins could be forgiven. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Please come to live in my heart and life. In your name I pray. Amen. Guys, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, either to accept Jesus' forgiveness or to, to begin to live, because they're really both the same prayer. You're asking God to forgive you and to come live in your life so that his plan and his purpose can become your life. If you did that for the very first time, I really want to know. Not because I want to, I'm just nosy, but because I want to be able to walk with you and pray with you all the time. Just drop me a comment in the, the comments section on the video um, on Facebook here or send me an email at the church. It's uh, kids.wcamn at gmail.com. If that one you know is too long, too long to remember, my personal email, you can email me there. It's nextwavekids at gmail.com. Uh, call the church and leave me a message. Call my personal cell phone if you, if you need that. Um, I'll make sure it's available to you, but have somebody text me and email me. But guys, let me know because I want to get stuff into your hands that will help you grow with God. And I want to pray for you and with you as often as I can. Now, to finish up, I think we should finally get to the point. I know, I know, I always start with the point, but here today we're going to do things a little bit different and we're going to get to the point. And I did this on purpose because I want you to remember the point. I want you to remember it really well. I'm not going to make you repeat it, I'm just going to say it a couple of times and I want you to really let it sink in. Here's the point. I won't let people pressure me into doing things that don't please God. I won't let people pressure me into doing things that don't please God. I beg that you'll remember that, pro that, uh, that point as we leave, guys, as we get ready to go about our week. I, I pray that you will make wise choices about the friends that you spend time with. And I, I pray that you will just choose to follow him and follow the rules that, that the people in your life have set for you so you can follow him. And I want you to remember that God is awesome. <laughs> and so it's like, I can't even come up with a better word because he is so awesome. And he will always help you if you ask him. I don't know about you, but I had a great time today. And I really can't wait to hear what Samson's going to get himself into next. But goodbye for now, or as they say in Paris, au revoir. Until next time, guys. I pray that you have an opportunity to grow in God. 
I pray that you have an opportunity to take his love into your heart. And I pray, guys, that you never, ever, ever, ever forget, no matter what, that you are loved so much more than you will ever be able to understand by God and by us. I'll see you next time here at High Point, okay? Bye!